Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in again for an Empower Tactical podcast. Today we have the great Barry Pang with us um, to share his knowledge, his obviously his path for his career, what he's accomplished uh, for his career, and uh, yeah, we'll have the great pleasure to have him with us today. Hey Barry, can you hear us properly? Yes, hi, how are you, Sifu Damien? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much for being part of this podcast. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know we've been in these podcasts for not so long now, but one of the main reasons is because we spend so much time inspiring people and we want to take the time and to acknowledge the groundwork of what others has done, such people as yourself, you know. You've obviously has contributed a lot to martial arts and still like to keep the art running in its tradition. And I believe that in this pandemic, tradition is very important because it it has taught me a lot, you know, coming from a traditional background of martial arts, talking about respect, discipline, and I think we can help so many people who will be listening to this podcast. Uh, thank you, uh, Damien. Very honoured to be part of it. And, you know, I've uh, seen a couple of your podcasts and, you know, um, just feel honoured to be uh, in the league of some of the people you've already interviewed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, tell us a little bit more. I mean, some people do know who you are. Who's, who's Barry Pang? How did all this start for your journey in martial arts? Well, as a kid, um, you know, at the time when I was young, in, in the 60s, the most popular things in action movies, of course, in Australia, we had the Samurai, uh, which was a big hit on TV here with the ninjas and so forth. It was like a cult movie. And obviously all the action movies like the James Bond uh, movies and The Man From U.N.C.L.E., they all feature martial arts. And you know, having Asian background, you know, we're always part of that and always been talking about it with the family. It's something that I've always uh, wanted to do. Unfortunately, at the, at the time in the 60s, there weren't many schools around. In, for, in fact, there was virtually no Kung Fu schools. The only things that were around at the time was... Um, a few uh, judo schools. Uh, Ivan Zavachanos was running a school out of Pasco Vale. The Mighty Apollo had a karate class in the city, which uh, they were inviting sometimes instructors from overseas. And um, uh, the only other uh, schools were a, a couple of Taekwondo schools that eventuated because uh, Ivan had brought out judo instructors from Korea, but found oh, wow. that they also but they also you know, practiced Taekwondo and they ran a few Taekwondo classes. The first one was Mr. Kim and then Mr. No came out, Kiang No. And okay. Taekwondo became more popular than the actual uh, judo that they were <laughs> brought out here to teach. And that's how it grew. And um, I was very fortunate to link up with uh, you know, one of Mr. No's students, uh, Jack Rosinski, who's now the highest graded non-Korean in the world. He's a knife dan, taekwondo. Oh, wow. and, and I think the only only Australian instructor that's trained a world champion out, out of Australia. Um, so I was lucky to be there. And that's where, uh, as, a, as a kid, um, there was a lot of the high level martial artists of today were training there. People like Bob Jones and, uh, you know, Warren Ross and all those people that, uh, uh, became you know, household names were part of that school because there was very few schools. And I think when uh, Jack started teaching, it was only a brown belt and he couldn't even call it Taekwondo because no one in Australia knew what Taekwondo was. So, wow. he used to, so the first name of that club was the Shuto Karate Club. And um, he used to put Korean karate because people didn't know what <laughs> Taekwondo was. So, I know, because so everyone, everyone thought, it, it's funny you say this though, because um, back in the old days when someone was going to do martial arts, it was so complicated to explain to someone that's got no idea what you're doing. You know, all they talk about is karate. Everyone, yeah. here, oh, you're going to do martial arts, you're going to do karate. They don't really know the different style, the way it comes from and so on. It's, it's, it's funny that just, I didn't know that. I didn't know that um, there wasn't many different type of martial arts in Australia back then. Except yeah, it was the very rare, uh, Damien, because, uh, you know, like it, people at that time thought it was mystical. It was the type of magic, you know, is it for real or not? Or are they just tricks they show on the <laughs> movies and on TV? So, um, but there were some people that were really keen, people like Jack Rosinski and, um, 
you know, uh, Sifu, uh, or Sensei Eddie Amin, they were part of that scene and they were so keen to learn what they used to do is they used to go down to the, uh, the wharf every Saturday and if they see any Asian that will come off the boats, either, you know, a staff or, or a tourist or whatever, they just used to go up to them and say, uh, look, um, you practice any martial arts? And if they said yes, they'd just whisk them down to their training hall and try and spar with them and learn, learn anything they could off them. So wow. that, that was what it was like at the time. And uh, uh, there was virtually no schools around and virtually uh, very few qualified instructors except for the couple of the Koreans. But uh, the problem was with the Koreans that they were mainly judo instructors that taught some Taekwondo. And then when the Taekwondo got popular, then, uh, you know, certain promoters brought out instructors. And then, of course, you know, in the 60s, our great friend, uh, Pino Severano, you know, that was when he came out and started. And then there's a whole uh, pool of um, you know, martial arts instructors that came out, Paul Giriot from France, and, uh, and it grew. But even then, Kung Fu was very little known. Uh, and mm -hmm. even, um, you know, up to the 70s when... The martial arts, uh, well, the Bruce Lee boom came. Everyone wanted to learn, but there's uh, very little uh, to learn uh, to places where you can learn from because uh, the rarity. And at the time, in that time, as you know, with the Wing Chun style in itself, that uh, Grandmaster Yip Man was still alive back then. And his instructions to his students was not to teach any foreigners uh, the Wing Chun Kung Fu. That's why the advent of Wing Chun really came about after he passed away. And, um, you know, uh, Grandmaster William Chong and others started teaching because they followed his instructions that uh, um, they weren't able to teach any foreigners uh, before he passed away. Wow. Wow, that's, that's, uh, that's amazing. It's, it's, it's crazy how the old tradition and and i guess you know there's probably some uh, when we look back in history and especially when i'll be teaching some school group and they will talk about tradition uh, martial arts in china and one of the reasons why they wouldn't teach the foreigners because they were obviously part of the tool and assets to be able to protect themselves you know in terms of war and so on so they had obviously their own reason why they wouldn't want to provide this information to the world of why they wouldn't want to share the knowledge of Wing Chun Kung Fu. And, it, and it's great to see that he's still, obviously after Ip Man passed away and everyone in their own way, Grandmaster William Chung, and as well as yourself, Sifu Barry Pang and other instructors around the world are keeping the tradition and making sure that um, people, even though they evolve in their art themselves, they want to keep the tradition going. And it's important to be remembered for the art of what, you know, anyone has contributed initially and how it was back in the days and and it's um you know it's great how have people get the most out of it to hear one of these well i think they yeah the history is so important because there's so many people around the world wanting to learn wing chun it's probably the most popular martial arts as a result of those uh donnie Yun Ip Man movies right uh, yeah. people all over and as you know you know on the postings on facebook or social media uh inquiries and likes come from all around the world and so many from africa afghanistan you know uh, the middle east uh, eastern europe is so popular but um there's obviously a real lack of instructors around because wing chun was a very small style in fact the wing chun throughout the world now 99 percent is Ip man wing chun and it came from one source uh, and it was just so lucky that he migrated to Hong Kong, otherwise uh, Wing Chun wouldn't exist today. But because of the popularity of the two waves, the first wave was Bruce Lee, second wave was Ip Man, and they both were involved with Wing Chun, that made the style so, so popular. But unfortunately around the world, because of the popularity, people are opening up schools, um, but they don't really know what the real Wing Chun is, and the Absolutely. students that are learning are missing out. But today, because we have access to you know, the, the internet and, you know, the, the social media and all the uh, videos, we can record it and we can reach anyone in the world, you know, right at this moment. 
which uh, enables us to pass the style on. If we if we had that years ago, we'd all we all would have had the correct Yip Man, Yip Man Wing Chun because we all could all you know zoomed in with him and and watched his. Uh, uh, Training and absolutely. I mean, everyone wished it could do that with the intensity. I mean, uh, authenticity of obviously the the, the wenching itself in its tradition, coming from directly from the source. Even though you know he was uh, he was through the internet. Everyone would love to do that. But the great thing that we were saying before, and we've had numerous conversation, you had the chance to to go there because obviously you speak Cantonese. And you got to speak um, with many instructors that were directly taught by Yip Man himself and well, trained them. Yeah, well, look, uh, um, I wanted to go back to the source and find out because there's so many arguments around who's the, the original Wing Chun. You know, after Yip Man passed away, everyone's claiming to, you know, mine's the authentic one. And... I wanted to find out, you know, directly from the source. Um, I wanted to meet as many uh, instructors that had trained with him. Uh, my main goal was to ask them what the training was like with Grandmaster Ip Man, not, to, you know, not to show their techniques. Or what I wanted to know is what was his philosophies, what was he like, what was his favourite techniques, and. Uh, Obviously, his sons, um, Yip Chin and Yip Ching, were probably the closest sources, although they had only uh, arrived in Hong Kong in the early 60s, and Ip Man's school had been going since the early 50s. So there was a, they weren't sort of, uh, they were a bit behind a lot of the early instructors. And But I want to find out what his philosophy was. And, yeah, basically to give people a bit of background with the, with, uh, the Ip Man Wing Chun. Um, Ip Man, as a young person, was from a very wealthy family. Um, and that's why he could afford it. And you, you read all the stories about him raising all that money and going up to Chan Hua, uh, and giving him you know, uh, many years savings to, to take him on as a student, as a 13 year old. I think everyone's, heard that story if they've read really Wing Chun. Um, so what happened was Yip Man was able to devote his time to the Wing Chun, right? Uh, yeah, he, he's not like most of us, un, us unlucky people had to work hard and had to go to school and do all these other things. So he concentrated entirely on, on his Wing Chun, right? Uh, and we were so lucky and unfortunate for him, but lucky for us that, um, you know, he had those two experiences in Hong Kong. First experience was when he went to school there because he was so wealthy. And then that was when he met, um, and he was a, a little bit of a, like all of us in our young days, like to, you know, uh, be proud of their art, try out other people. And, There's trouble. You know, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the word was out at school. He's only a young, young lad then and that, uh, you know, he was up to all challenges and he'd won all these challenges until, you know, one of his um, uh, co-students co said, look, my uncle knows a little bit of uh, Kung Fu. Maybe you'd like to meet him. So Ip Man was very keen. So he took him to his house and this man was a businessman. He was quite wealthy, you know, not a martial arts instructor. And um, so... Ip Man was very impatient, let's, you know, yeah, he started warming up, let's get on with it. And, and while he's warming up, uh, the other chap said, oh, so you're, you've practiced chum kill. <laughs> uh, so uh, how much more have you done yeah, in Wing Chun? And uh, Ip Man said, look, let's get on with it. Don't, like, but it didn't strike him that this guy knew about Wing Chun. Wow. Uh, Obviously, when, when they took each other on, uh, Ip Man lost out, but being a very smart uh, lad, he just said, look, I really want to learn from you. Obviously, your Wing Chun is superior, so different to what I've learned. Um, can I follow you? And he, and, and he said, no, look, I'm, I'm a businessman. Look, I don't have time to teach. But Ip Man was very persuasive you know, and talked him into it. And it turned out that uh, that, that man was Long Bic which was Long Jun, the right. last Grandmaster's son. 
And his Wing Chun was a lot different to Chan Wah's Wing Chun from Fat Sun. Uh, he was a, only a small man. He had very relaxed techniques. He had a lot of very good footwork and pivoting. He would be, be able to redirect force. And it wasn't just a hard Wing Chun style of just going forward with chain punches. He had more than that. He, he'd be able to defend that by changing his angle. So uh, he studied with him while he was in Hong Kong. And obviously, when Yip Man went back to Fatsan after uh, his studies, um, he was superior to everyone else in his school, and he had this new style of Wing Chun, uh, which combined Chan Wah's uh, Wing Chun with uh, Long Bik's Wing Chun. And, uh, and then the next, obviously, important thing in our history was the fact that the communist government was taking over in China, and Yip Man had to flee China and, and uh, go to Hong Kong. And when he went to Hong Kong, it was the first time in his life that he had to seriously work, like all of us. <laughs> because he was from a wealthy family. All of a sudden, um, you know, he had to sort of earn himself a living because he was there on his own and um, with his wife. I think the children stayed in China at the time. And um, for the first time in his life, he had to work. And the only thing he knew well, really well, was Wing Chun mm. Kung Fu. So mm -hmm. that's how he first started teaching. Now, he wasn't keen to teach, but it was through necessity. And he wasn't an experienced instructor because he was a student in all that time for many years. So all of a sudden he had to run a school. So there was a bit of a dilemma there and he had to depend on other people. And of course, the first school that started was at the, um, the Hong Kong um, Waiters Club. They had a facility there where a lot of the early students were in the restaurant trade and they got him to teach. Uh, he was very reluctant to teach them. And he used to teach in riddles, right? That's why, and Chinese instructors, the old style used to talk, talk in riddles. Like one of my other instructors that I learned from, yeah, he, he said, um, which means you have to be loose, but you have to be tight. So you sort of think, how could that be? You're even losing <laughs> time. So, so you have to work it out in your own brain, you know, uh, what they mean by that. They used to talk in riddles. And the other thing Yip Man used to do is he used to agree with everyone. So you'd come, come to him and you'd say, ah, Sifu, uh, Bong Sao, should it be like this? Or should it be tense? Or should it be relaxed? As soon as you say, should it be relaxed? He'll say, yes. The next guy will go, Sifu, should it be tense? Yes. So everyone thinks they're getting the right instruction from him. And then um, uh, basically uh, that's how the differences came in, 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 the, in the Wing Chun. Because they, they, no one's lying. That's what he said. Yeah, that's yeah. the right way. And there was a very famous story about Ip Man that, um, you know, uh, a very wealthy person that was wanted to learn Wing Chun came, came up to Ip Man and said, um, Ip Sifu, um, will you teach me the wooden dummy? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you 3,000 Hong Kong dollars for showing me the wooden dummy. And he said, yes, I'll do that. Hand over the 3,000. And he hand over the $3,000. Ip Man goes onto the dummy and goes, bang, 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 goes through it once. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, he said, um, uh, so, please, when are you going to start teaching me? I said, he said, no, that's not, that's not part of the deal. The deal was you paid me 3000 for showing you the dummy. I just showed you. No so, way. <laughs> it's a very, very famous story, right? And, and as far as Wing Chun is concerned, and I mean, I think that this um, um, Zoom uh, session probably focused more on Wing Chun because, um, you know, you've had so, uh, so many other ones with other martial absolutely, arts. Absolutely, absolutely. Because and you're, I'm, I'm you're a Wing Chun. Absolutely. I was going to ask you, because you, cause you mentioned, obviously, you, you've met so many of these people yourself and, you, and you've obviously got so, much, um, so many stories from all the different instructors that were there back then. And you were saying that they were uh, explaining when they were learning from Yip Man or the stories. And, and did you, did you feel that in terms of their, his philosophy and his training methodology, was it consistent with everyone or was it a little bit different? Well, yeah, let me explain about Wing Chun. Like, I mean, um, a lot of your viewers would know a fair bit about Wing Chun. They're 
most of them would be practitioners. Wing Chun is a very sophisticated style of martial arts. It's based on very much you know, scientific theory. And it's a, not an easy style to learn. You might equate, like if, if you're any interest in cars, right? You'd say um, Wing Chun would be like a Formula One racing car. A lot of other martial arts, the hard ones that, um, you know, for young blokes to learn, they could be more equated to a truck. Now, with a Formula One car, it's so finely tuned, you get a speck of, a speck of dirt, uh, dust into the, into the uh, fuel system and the car doesn't run at all. Yeah, it, it just stops. With a, with a truck, you can run out of oil and it still go, you can still drive to Sydney in it because it's so rugged. But when the finely tuned Formula One car is on song, it will beat the truck around the track, you know, many times over. And that's the problem with Wing Chun because it's so precise, a little error in one of the sections of the techniques because the techniques require so much coordination where you are actually using probably a hundred or more muscles in your body at once and has to be in the right combo at the right time because in the process of uh, doing a technique, you know, even just like a block punch with a pivot, you are actually pivoting, using both hands at the same time, um, you know, redirecting your opponent's force. You, and yeah, you're doing many, many things at the one time um, and your body has to coordinate that. So it's very finely tuned. You get one of those little things wrong with the timing out. If you start your pivot uh, after you start your punch, you're never going to get it there because the punch is much faster than the pivot. So the timing is, it has to start from the feet and end up at the, at the, at the knuckle when you're striking your opponent. You get the timing wrong. Um, and if you work out mathematically how many degrees of freedom there are there, it's like, uh, you know, thousands upon thousands of degrees of freedom at the same time. When you work out uh, the, the chances of getting it right, when you multiply the probabilities, it comes to, you know, uh, hundreds of millions or even billions to one to get it right. So that's how hard it is to do a technique correctly. And we've got to train our bodies to do that. So it's a very sophisticated style. So having said that, you know, when people practice the Wing Chun, um, because the instructors, what they've learned, they're representing what they've actually learned from Grandmaster Yip Man. But the way they present it, could end up completely different because just a little minute difference anywhere, or even not even in the technique, but in the emphasis of, on the techniques will change the style completely, right? And so true. That's, and, and I think all the Wing Chun practitioners will know that. You know, you're talking in millimeters or less, not inches or feet, right? And to get it right is very hard. And that's why uh, Yip Man, he obviously you know, wanted everyone to learn, but it was so difficult to teach because it was such a precise art. And uh, it's one of those arts that you can't mass teach right? because you know, just the chiso itself is one-to-one. -one, you know? So you can't have the whole army there of 30,000 people lining up and, and an instructor counting and following him to do the techniques. You've got to actually guide each individual student and train the sensitivity in his arms uh, where, you know, one to one, and you've got to have a high quality instructor to do that. That's why it makes it very hard to mass produce Wing Chun. It's so, that's so true though, because obviously it, it's, it's, it's feeling the energy of the other person. You can't obviously just look at it, someone doing chi, so like you did well without knowing the amount of pressure and feeling from the other person, you know? And obviously everyone, like you say, will react differently if their brain is thinking, okay, I've got to focus on my forward energy and the other person just being more relaxed to feel the other person moving and, and reacting to that. It's all about the reaction process. And mm -hmm. it makes it very hard, like you say, um, and, and I'll pick up on the point that you mentioned today, because many people say this, you know, Yiman was a great instructor. I mean, he was a great student of the art. He was a great um, martial artist in himself, but to be able to translate and provide this information to the mass of students, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard if you don't know how to teach it properly, you know. And, and, and as well as that, Damien, that um, uh, his 
Wing Chun evolve, just like it evolved, yeah, you know, when he went to Hong Kong and trained under Long Bit, yeah, you know, it evolved from what he learned from Chan Wah, right? And throughout its life, it evolves like all of us, our martial arts evolves, right? Although we still follow the, the principles of the Wing Chun, right? The, your center line theories, your economy of movement, all that, but your, 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 your techniques can evolve. And as you see with the Wing Chun practitioners, those that have trained under Yip Man, the ones, the early brigade, you know, which be, mean Long Song, Lok Yil, Choi Xiong Tin, they were the early ones at the Hong Kong Waiters Club. Compared to the, 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 the latest ones being Long Ting and a few of the others, then you have all the in-between, like uh, yeah, Grandmaster William and uh, Wong Sun Long and that. Their Wing Chun is different to the early ones and the later ones. Because Ip Man did vary the techniques. He did change them throughout his life as he taught. Right? Uh, being the Grandmaster, he had the right to do that. Right, He was the Absolutely. last. Yeah, and, and basically what happened was he did modify those techniques uh, uh, for the better uh, when he had the chance. And, uh, the, the, and, and the big difference in the Wing Chun practitioners too, as I said, Ip Man was very traditional Chinese that you, know, you don't just teach the art to ev everyone. You find that ideal student that you pass it on to that he'll be the inheritor of the style. But unfortunately, he had to teach Wing Chun for a living. So any Tom, Dick and Harry that turns up in his school pays the fees, he had to accept them, right? So he, he was very selective. And that's why he'd agree with virtually everything. You know, if you say, do you do it like this? He'll say yes. If you're doing <laughs> it wrong, he'll still say yes, right? Yeah. Um, and everyone got a different opinion from him because that was your opinion and he'll just agree with you, right? It was very fortunate there was three students of uh, Ip Man that were a bit different, right? And, you know, we're lucky to be involved with two of the three and the third one is my second cousin. So, so uh, basically, um, they were Wong Sun Wong, William Chong and Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee to a minor extent, uh, but the other two were his main students for the main reason was not because they were good students and that, but because they were bad students, they went out and fought. That's <laughs> right? it. They went out and challenged. They went to train out. Yeah. So, so Ip, Man, Ip Man was in a dilemma, right? He goes, these guys, they're not doing the right thing, although he loved fighting himself, you know, but he, you know, uh, you, I, I can't, um, you know, visibly be encouraging them, right? But he had the dilemma in that, if I don't teach these guys properly, they'll lose. And they are upholding the honor of Wing Chun. So therefore, presenting him. so they got a little bit different training because they'd come to him and say, well, Sifu, you know, I had trouble with this technique when I fought that guy. And uh, basically, um, uh, how, how do I handle it? And then he'd give them the answer. And to just give you one, one example, um, I might need to show you uh, yeah, that's fine. That's um, fine. I'll give you the background first. Uh, Wong Sun Long was, uh, had a challenge fight with uh, this master of uh, iron palm, right? And what happened was, um, yeah, in the challenge fight, um, the, the, the iron palm practitioner, and can I move back and just show you now? Uh, yeah, of course you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. That's fine. Now, now, um, the, the, the iron palm practitioner went to strike him underneath with an arm, one of these lower iron palm techniques, right? Yeah. Wong Sun Long used from Wing Chun this Matsu technique to deflect it, but the, the opponent's hand slid past, he, he half blocked it, and it hit him on and the hips. hips here, right? Yeah. So, in his cylinder tail form, you know, in the third part where you have the movement come out, it came in like that, it come back here, it circled and it struck. Yeah. So he went back to Yip Man and he said, Sifu, I used that technique um, and he still got me. And Yip Man said, oh, gun sale. you should be using gun sale. He said, but there's no gun sale in, in, in the cylinder tail form. He goes, okay, so we're going to add it. So he changed that movement to there, 
to the gun so to there and circle right and then come back and as, as you watch the Wing Chun practitioners throughout the world all the early ones Long Song, Lok Yil, Choi Shong Tin they only have that first movement the Lat Sao right and then go underneath yeah, but all the, the yeah all the later ones like Long Ting and all those people uh, Yip Chun, Yip Ching they only have the lower one they don't have the first one no. because Wong Sun Long was there at the time when it happened and he's involved he's the only one that has both of those in his form and that's how it evolved right and same mm. the wooden dummy the wooden dummy sequence was different if man changed it to make that important part the first section of it um and, and because yeah he felt that that's the way it should go so um there's a lot of changes like that in wing chun and it gives you an idea of uh, how complex the style is. And, mm -hmm. and the other thing is, I feel that when Ip Man died, a very large percentage of Wing Chun was lost with him, that he never, never taught. Um, you know, uh, in my investigations, you know, I was told that Ip Man's kicking was something unbelievable. From the Chi Sao position, he could kick you under the chin, standing that close, right? His footwork was that good. And if you try to run away from him, he can be on one leg and he can chase you, keep throwing kicks at you, you know, for, for, and, until you reach the, the, the wall. I, I, right? I heard this, I heard this, and it's, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's one of the, not, it's incredible story because they obviously talk about winching that we don't kick above the waist. Mm. But yeah, he obviously has some really, really good kicks. Incredible. I, I, I assume though, yeah, those above the waist kicks were just for your training. But but he could throw the continuous low kicks, you know, as you ran away from him. So he's on one leg, hopping on one leg. He can continuously chase you with those kicks, even with you running away on both legs, right? He was that good, right? But uh, people's leg techniques weren't good enough to learn that. And Wong Sun Leung himself told me, he goes, I couldn't do it. My kicks aren't very good, right? And he goes, but Wing Chun was such a strong style. I can win all my encounters. He won all these challenge fights. He goes, I never ever used the kick. You know? I only yeah. used the hand. Right. There's right. Usually, usually the chain punches were enough to win the encounter. So people didn't need to go and learn those techniques. And uh, when he passed away, a lot of it, was probably lost with him, right? Uh, um, yeah, we can try and piece it together best we can, but it's very hard not having him around and seeing him in action, right? But uh, yeah, so and 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 the way he trained, obviously Wing Chun is a very simple style um, with only three forms and the wooden dummy and uh, and Chi Sao exercise. Uh, Yip Man. Yeah, started training when he was 13 and when he died, he'd nearly been training 60 years on three forms and a set of wooden dummy techniques and chisel. So obviously, you know, he had it to such a high standard and this is one of the biggest problems of Wing Chun today. The coordination and everything required. People want to rush. You know, they want to learn it in a hurry. Like the man that went to him and said, I'll give you $3,000 to show yeah. me that the wooden dummy technique. This man hadn't even practiced seal, seal and tail yet, right? And he's yeah, wanting to right. learn the wooden dummy. Like we're just saying, we ask people, if you're building a house, do you put the roof on first or do you do the foundations? And then when you build a house, the foundation looks like, you know, uh, for months and months, nothing's happening. It's just a hole in the ground. And then all of a sudden, when they put up the frame and then they start bricking up, within a few days, it looks like a house. But the foundation has taken them 90% of the time. And, and without the foundation, the house would just fall over. So training martial arts is the same. Without the foundation, um, it falls over very quickly. And a lot of people wanting the rush they create the problem. That's why the ceiling tail, the time has to be done there to build up those suppleness in your ankles, to build up the strength and the stance, to build up this bottom forward position, which um, 
I will explain later that we want to go to the next step on that, which is one of the most important things in Wing Chun that most people don't realize that, yeah, having the bottom forward, uh, yeah, is so important to generate the power in your techniques. Now, um, basically, one of the very good lessons I learned, I want to share this with everyone. When I went over to Hong Kong and had a great uh, chat meet up with uh, Grandmaster Ip Chun, I asked him about his father. And one of the classic stories he said to me was, you know, when I was training with my father and I was practicing Chum Kill form, and this, uh, in the first part of the Chum Kill form, this movement where we turn like that, yeah. you know, he goes, his dad made him do it for th uh, three months and he got impatient. He said, dad, I've been doing this thing for three months, you know. When am I going to go on to the next thing? It's just the turning. It looks so simple. It's, uh, when am I going to do some more advanced techniques? And he said, son, I practiced that thing for three years. Wow. But the turning is not as easy as it because you've got to turn and stop on the spot, stop on the spot. And you've got to have the power to come with it because in the end, the movement might only be a fraction of an inch, but you've got to get the power there, right? You won't get to do the full thing like that. And this is where people get confused with their training. They got, get, try to go too quick. And also they don't understand what the applications of those techniques are because it's not obvious from the form. When you look at the form, that technique looks like it's unimportant. In fact, it's one of the most important techniques in Wing Chun. And in the wooden dummy movements, in the first uh, uh, couple of movements where you come there and you turn and strike, it incorporates that, but only a small section, only the first um, like few centimetres of that movement. But if you've done that movement for a long time, even in a couple of centimetres, you'll develop the power because you know how to control the hips and stop start it straight away where you want. Because the tendency, if you don't practice it well, when you turn, you keep going. You can't break mm -hmm. it on the spot. Yeah. So whenever you, know, you have to shorten it, you might have to break it on the spot, right? So it just stops there because if you overcommit and turn, you're exposing the back, right? So you've got to stop straight away. Having that control of the hip is so important. Only a little thing, but that is what caught so many people out. And mm -hmm. Ip Man, being a very small person, He's very, very small. His footwork and footwork meaning, uh, you know, body shifting, whether it's pivoting, whether it's stepping, whether it's even a very, even small change of angle. He was a master at that. And, and that's why he spent three years practicing that thing and refining it. And people don't even understand. And people want to go on to practice Bilgi. They want to practice the wooden dummy. Well, this is, this, is, uh, this is one of the main challenges we're facing today, you know, whether this pandemic or not. I mean, it's, I mean, it's kind of a um, blessing that we have this pandemic. I mean, I've done a few classes and talking to people. And it's, the, the thing is, people don't realize the understanding of the technique. People tend to rush of applications and, and trying to put in practice what they think is going to work, you know. And they try to compare different type of martial arts to Wing Chun Kung Fu. I always said the expectation of the study, if I will talk about Wing Chun Kung Fu, for instance, one of the most important part of the Slim Tao form is teaching your brain to use arms and legs at the same time because you have to be structured properly with your foundation. And, and I guess it's one of the main challenges that man, a lot of instructors would face, you know, because you have students that seen the movie and like, oh my God, after a month, they will be able to do the chain punches and be able to move like, Yip Man or Bruce Lee, you know, but that's not really the case and it's important to set an expectation. Did you, did you think um, or for that it was very challenging for you to, to be able to, because obviously you have schools and you've been teaching and you had obviously so many different sectors where you were teaching as well as schools, um, not martial arts school, but, you know, college as well. Do you think that was very challenging? How did you overcome the challenge to be able to explain these students that patience in learning, which after... Um, obviously myself, after so many years of training, you realize that was the most important part of my training. Now the applications or 
doing drills of chisau and having the intensity, but the footwork, the, um, the, the right positioning, the angle and timing of punching. How did you overcome those challenges? Because I'm sure you may have encountered Well, them. in running a school, and we all know this, the really difficulty is you've got to balance the scales because, uh, you know, if you take it slowly, people quit right? and you run out, you can't make a living out of Absolutely. teaching Kung Fu or any martial arts. But then if you rush them, you might have a bigger school, but none of your guys are any, going to be any good because you've rushed them through and they haven't mastered things and you've, they've done things out of sequence, which really wrecks their technique, right? So it's a real dilemma. But the original Chinese idea of a martial arts instructor is they look for one student only, right? Um, if you look in the course of history, it's the famous students that have built up the name of the school. It's not the number of students, right? Yeah. So in the recent times um, with the Japanese arts and the Korean arts, they want to have like uh, thousands of schools throughout the world and uh, hundreds of thousands of students and the style is big, right? Uh, whereas the, the typical Chinese instructor only wants one good student that will carry the name of the school to the next generation, right? And you look so hard to find that one student, right? Uh, yeah. and, 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 that's, and you've got to have the student that's patient enough to go through that. Because if I said to you, um, okay, well, look, um, Ip Man is, uh, you know, he trained for 60 years. If he trained for 60 years, then, um, well, there's three forms in Wing Chun. So, therefore, he should be 20 years on each form. So, he'd be still practicing still in tail form after 20 years. How many students will put up with that? If, you, if someone came to you and said, this slow form that you're doing in a stationary position, you've got to practice that thing for 20 years before you go <laughs> on to the next form. You reckon you'd have any anyone in your class? You know? No, we'll um, be gone the next week. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so. Um, yeah, students are impatient and that really sort of um, uh, destroys their Wing Chun, right? Uh, uh, you notice that Silim Tao form is done stationary. Yeah, you don't on the spot. There's no footwork there. You're just training your handwork, but it's the forerunner for the footwork. It's building up your strength. With the toes inwards, you're loosening your ankle, right? Yeah, you're learning to relax because you do it so slowly, right? If you did it fast, you would be able to, to relax, right? You gain strength in the center line because you spend so much time there, right? Yeah. Without doing all that, if you went on to the next form, Chung Kill, which does have footwork and does have body shifting, your techniques aren't going to be there for the, for the, absolutely, for the footwork. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and that's what people don't understand. They want to rush it. And because the style looks so simple, they think, well, I can learn this in no time, but it's not the case, right? And, um, you know, if you, if you went slowly, and I found the people in my school, the people who went slowly were very few, you know. The ones that actually listen to me are very few because everyone's got their own mind. But I would say the person that listens to me most in my school is my own wife, Anne. <laughs> and she is the best by far. She can take on ten, uh, 10 or so of the next highest grades all together, not one after another, all together in multiples, uh, in a multiple spa because she spent the time because I said, develop your stance, develop your footwork. Doesn't matter your size. I mean, look at Ip Man, he's smaller than you. He developed his footwork. He can it's redirect right. force. He never opposed your opponent's strength. Uh, yeah, he used their opponent's strength against them. But to be able to do that takes so much coordination and timing and reflex and sensitivity. You've got to put in the time to do it. She actually did it. And now she's reaping the rewards. The guys that you know, went the hard way and you know, punching bags and all that. Yeah, at the start, yeah, as beginners, they, they were more advanced. They went in tournaments. They did all right in tournaments by just using chain punches. Once they got advanced, though, you know, they're trying to hit her. She's behind them, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, just by simple footwork, right? And and, and, uh, and and that's why we're 
you know, the patience comes in, right? Uh, everything depends on patience, whether you're in business or whatever, right? I mean, um, you know, as far as business, um, yeah, Warren Buffett's the guru of investing, and he says, "Yeah, you know, I, I invest um, for the long term. I don't care about the day-to-day -day fluctuations." And then they come up the saying, "It's it's not timing, but it's time in. How much time you've got in, right?" And I never forget our greatest horse trainer in Australia, as far as Melbourne Cups, is a man called Bart Cummings. So even if you don't know about racing, you don't follow it, you heard of Bart Cummings, right? Yeah, absolutely. When he passed away, there was two, two, two people that gave eulogies to him. One was his son, Anthony, and, and the other one was the, the, the top trainer in Australia, Chris Waller. And they asked him, what most you remember about your dad or and to... Uh, uh, Chris Waller, what do you, most do you remember about uh, Bart Cummings? And both of them said the same one word, patience. Patience is that's everything. That's why he was so good. Yeah, that's why he was so good, because he had the patience, right? And and this is what we need in martial arts as well. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, um, and Wing Chun especially, it's a building block, because Wing Chun starts off, yeah, just a simple, you know, wrist circling, you know, just one part of your body in a stationary position. And then, and then it ends up, you know, with uh, both hands doing separate things, doing a pivot or a body shift, you know, at the same time, you know, redirecting your opponent's force, you know, using your, 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 your whole body, your hips and everything all at once, right? Um, to go from the single technique to that stage, it takes a lot of coordination and adding things on a bit at a time because you can't concentrate on a hundred things at once. You can only yeah. concentrate on one thing. Get, get each one of those right and then add it on and then one becomes two things. Yeah, and then you've got the two coordinated. Then you add the third one. Yeah, and then you add the fourth one. In the end, after many years, you've got a hundred things that are together that's done properly at the right time, you become a really good martial artist. Absolutely. That's, that's words of wisdom right now. And, you know, that's one of the main reasons we do this podcast. It's not, and, and uh, this is one thing that I really appreciate about you, because um, we had so many numerous conversations, as I said, at the start of the podcast, is that having no ego and willing to learn and adapt and, and, and be interested in, in finding out not so much about the truth and, and learning what's, right for you in terms of the art you know and that's why you've done your research and and you're still maintaining your um willingness to teach and to spread the knowledge of winter which is amazing you know and it's all about patience like you said and i think this is more important about learning the form if you don't have the patience to understand the form rather than knowing the techniques and i think it's a very key aspect that anyone who will be listening today it's important for them to know it doesn't mean because you can look good in front of the mirror or the camera by doing some techniques of Wing Chun that means that it's going to work. You know, it's important to have good foundation, and that's that's it's for me. It's very important to for people to know that whether they do martial arts or not, patience, like you say, it has a businessman is as important. Well, you've got to get all those little things right, Damien, because it's like it's like your Formula One car. You know, it's just one thing wrong you know like a little bit of dust in the car you know in the uh fuel system and it doesn't work or um you know any break in the chain you know one of your belts break uh, the rest of the car's working okay but so in our wing chun you know we're doing so many things at once any one of those little belts break and your technique's no good right the whole yeah. thing falls down it's not like see the whole car won't even start you know it's not like oh, I can keep running and you'll just go a bit slower. No, without that, your car won't even start, right? So mm -hmm. same with your wing turn, right? If you get one little thing wrong, um, then basically the whole technique is won't work. Um, so you need to get those little things right. Now, if there was a quicker way of doing it, yeah, I'd, please tell me, right? Because, <laughs> I mean, you know, a lot of hard work, a lot of time in training. But so true. Yeah, but if um, yeah, if anyone's got a quick solution, 
please give it to me. You know, like we're talking about modern technology and maybe having things tied to your arms and forcing, <laughs> you know, for, Can you, you know, imagine robot, that? Using robots and all that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe we can, in some day, we'll be able to do that or, or virtual reality that makes you do it, right? So the new matrix. Yeah, but we're not at that stage yet. So we've got no, to do no. it the old way, which is, um, you know, uh, um, you know uh, the way I've been taught to train and it's proven successful. And it's all the, the hare and the tortoise story, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the guy that starts out in front, it's, it's who's, who's in front when the siren goes and the fat lady sings the thing. It doesn't matter who's winning at quarter time in a football match or half time. Yeah, it's who's in front when the siren goes that's important and that's what we're trying to achieve in our martial arts, right? Uh, um, and I've been lucky too, I mean, um, to come across the right people, right? Yeah, having the right instructors really count. And I, I want to just, you know, go through this little bit in the end because it's so important that Wing Chun, who invented Wing Chun? There's a few stories, but what's the main accepted story? What's the main story of Wing Chun? About a woman who invented Wing Chun? Yeah, who invented Wing Chun? Who's acknowledged it? Well, Mui, right? Mui, exactly. Mui, right? Yeah. Buddhist nun Mui. I said in the French way, in you. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, <laughs> uh, well, the story goes, we don't know if it's true or not because we weren't there 300 years ago, whatever it was. But, but what happened was that she invented the style to teach Yim Wing Chun, uh, the Wing Chun style, because Yim Wing Chun had not practiced any martial arts before, so she hasn't been bastardized in her techniques and that, right? So she could start from scratch and invent something, regardless of size, that was suitable for a woman that can be practiced in secret because you didn't need a lot of space, right? All those things. And having a superior training instructor, she was able to impart her techniques of the chi cell to, to a student, uh, like downloading a, a program on your computer, right? Because you know, her hands will actually make you do the right things. So, but Moi herself, her style of Kung Fu was not Wing Chun. She'd practiced, Shaolin, she practiced multiple styles, right? She was one of the five elders of Shaolin, right? Exactly. And she'd practiced Shaolin Kung Fu, all the different styles that they taught there her whole life, right? And then she developed her own take on those techniques. And her style of Kung Fu was a style called Lung Ying, dragon shape, dragon Kung Fu. And um, uh, it, it was a very famous style in China, but not so much outside of China because, um, you know, the Wing Chun came out with fire, Ip Man, with the, the dragon style, it didn't come out uh, uh, as readily, right? And what, what happened was that um, Moi, after she taught Yin Wing Chun, when she moved on, she developed her own kung fu and she was teaching people at the monasteries as she moved on and for for 300 odd years they'd gone different paths right yeah, and wow. yeah in in the uh late 80s i met a man out of china and actually it came out that Anne's mother was running a chinese class at, at um uh, on a Sunday, and the the parents used to practice some Tai Chi to pass the time, waiting for their kids. And she goes, "This guy's not bad. We've got to go and see him, right? Uh, yeah, you know, he's, he's Tai Chi. Yeah, you know, he can actually use it, I think, right? So anyway, um, we and and it's just funny that the lady that was helping us at our house, she goes, "That's my brother," and we said, "Oh, look, what's he practice? He, uh, he goes, oh, he does Tai Chi, but he practices also." Uh, uh, Lung Ying, you know, Dragon Shape and all that. Uh, can we meet him? Because you know, we'd like to see more of his Kung Fu. And then what, what she said was, uh, you're even luckier because his master is here. He married the, the master's daughter. That's his father-in-law. Lives at he, his house. I can introduce you to him. So he came down and met us and he already knew everything about us. He knew everyone that was in Melbourne. He was very well informed. He knew about uh, Grandmaster William, everyone who was teaching here and all. He goes, look, um, my style of Kung Fu is invented by Ngmoy. 
and you know she invented Wing Chun as well. He goes, my instructor, Lam Yul Gui, who he considered the greatest master of all time, he goes, you throw all of them against him at once, you'd beat the whole lot because uh, he was that good, very well known, like if you research him, Lam Yul Gui is his name. And what happened was he said, um, uh, his hands, he was a very stocky guy. He was a big, strong guy. Yeah. He goes, his hands were like water, right? He goes, nice. you, can't ever, you can't ever lock him or anything. It's like, he goes, I could never do that. I'm smaller than him. And I thought I was more relaxed, but his hands just flow <laughs> like anything. And, and he said, um, for me to practice that, I went out and practiced Tai Chi and these other styles, well, Habafat, yeah, that had those flowing, slow techniques. But he goes, he got it naturally. And he goes, what, but he, what he wanted to do was to learn Wing Chun. Because he knew that they were two styles that came from uh, Mui. But he goes, I had no access. He goes, I looked in Canton and there's two main schools of Wing Chun in Canton. There was um, Sun Nan Sifu and uh, Pan Nan Sifu was the Fat San Wing Chun. The guy okay. was the, uh, I can give you some footage of him. We went to his school. It's complete, a lot different to the. Be great with him. But anyway, what happened was he goes, they weren't in much good, he said. So I went to Tai Chi and that. He goes, you're lucky you've learned Wing Chun. He goes, if you learn this Lung Ying as well, because they complement each other, because Mumo invented it, and it has a lot of counters to the Wing Chun techniques. In a later podcast, uh, Damien, we could do the thing is how to beat the center line. The stronger the center line, the more it could be against you. Yeah, If you use Lung Ying techniques, you lock them in their center line. Uh, uh, it has all that because it's always own techniques. And the other thing that it has is the next generation of getting power from the waist, you know, the bottom in. It yeah. goes a step further. It really emphasizes to the nth degree the fact that you know, Lam Yul Gui went up and trained with a monk at the temple and he trained four years just doing this basic stepping footwork, what we call Ngat Ma, to gain the power in, in, in the waist you know, around that hip area. There, there is a story that um, you laugh at this, right? That in China, he used to, you get a coin and you stick it in his bottom and he'd grip it with his, with his gluts, right? And people can put, um, you know, uh, pliers and grip it, they can't pull it out. Because no way. he was so <laughs> tough and he had so much power from there where you develop the potential energy from the hip, you see. Because people say, okay, um, you know, is it possible for me to move in to you faster than you can hit me with a punch. Usually it's impossible. The hand's so much faster than the footwork. Right? Mm. Now he was able to move in uh, meters and meters before you can even move your hand up. And you oh, say wow. that's and, and people say that's impossible, right? And I said and people ask me, you can't do that. Yeah, it's impossible. I said, um, you you gotta think outside the square. I said yeah, so what, what are you thinking of? Yeah, I'm starting from scratch. I'm going to throw a punch, you yeah, know, and I've got to move in as a longer distance. So therefore, you know, you're going to, the punch is going to beat you there for sure, right? And I say, yeah, but think outside the square. I said, uh, you see, what, what does a punch do? You're starting here, and then you start with zero velocity. And then you build up the speed, like a car, north to 60. Yeah, what's the time, right? Yeah. We don't want that. We want the reverse. We want the top speed going down to zero. And we said, how do you do that? That's impossible. <laughs> we want to start at 100 miles an hour and end up at zero. So the first few meters is at 100 miles an hour, not, from, not, not starting from zero and building up and taking a few. Okay. I said, look around you. Do your little children ever play with toy guns? Now, yeah. have you ever seen them with those guns where, you know, they've got a spring there, you push it in and you've got this little suction thing and you stick yeah. it there and then you pull the trigger and that thing flies out and, you know, you, know, you stick it onto the window and all that. 
Yeah. Or any gun. It starts off at 3,000 kilometers an hour and ends and up at zero and it goes down due to wind resistance. So if you use that theory and you start off at maximum speed and don't have to build up, you might be able to beat that guy's punch with your footwork. So that's what Lung Yang trained. Now, in principle, that's a principle of physics that Moy wouldn't have known at the time, but by trial and error, she worked out. That's why she was a genius, right? So what happens, you build up the potential energy from the hit area, and then when you let it go, it starts at terminal velocity, and then it slows down as it reaches your opponent. And you land your the, other, the other guy of the punch is starting from zero velocity and building up to the top speed. So if you get the timing right and you've got to do it correctly, you can beat him and get there before he actually uh, goes the punch. punch. Yeah. So therefore, we've, we've made the impossible possible, haven't we, Damien? That's amazing. Uh -huh. I you have been obviously very lucky to have met so many amazing instructors that had, um, you know, so much um, knowledge, but not so much that they wouldn't want to share, but they took the time to explain to you the benefit and the, the physics and the, the, the fact and why they would do this. And I think that's what people need these days, you know? Well, you've got to get along with everyone. Look, I, I, I was lucky in that, you know, most Kung Fu guys can't fight because they don't do any sparring, right? True. Even the even the Wing Chun schools, you know, you might start with the Chi Sao position and then start some flurries and that, and then you'll go back to the Chi Sao position. But they don't do any free sparring. I don't know now. I mean, in the past, they didn't, right? It was just practicing the forms. And you say, okay, I've got the wooden dummy and I've got Chi Sao, but there's no actually free sparring where you start with a gap and then, you know, Guys are throwing kicks and all that stuff, right? Uh, I was very lucky to have practiced with those tough guys in the beginning when we were kids, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was, and being Asian, very small. And when you, when, when I, I remember, you know, um, uh, Bob, Bob, my good friend Bob Jones, when he went to train with Tino, every time he got a new belt, he'd come back to us, right? Because he trained mm -hmm. with us before to show off, yeah, oh, yeah, I've got my yellow belt, I've got my green belt. And, and and obviously uh, Jack would put them in the class. He used to come in Mike Costello and another guy uh, called Gary Spears. I don't know if you heard of Gary Spears, but he was a massive guy. Mm -hmm. right? uh, he went to he he went to um, uh, uh, Japan and trained with Yamaguchi, and then went to Europe and became head instructor of Gojo in Europe. Right? Uh -huh. uh, he had to he had to leave the country because they were all bouncing. Right? And he bit a guy's ear off. So he, had to, he had to leave and went to New Zealand. He's from New Zealand originally, and then he went to. Uh, but they were massive guys, right? And I mean, Bob and Mike Costello in their peak, they were very frightening. If you don't, if you don't believe me, ask Richard. Right? Richard Norton was training with Mike Costello. He was a terror in those early Goju days. Oh right? wow! Yeah, you know, he used to terrorize. I've heard, I've heard some stories. I've yeah, yeah. Stories. So yeah, Bob and Mike used to come in, right? And invariably we'd have to spar them, right? I mean, you know, like, and you look at Bob and uh, big guy, and, <laughs> and th they never used to pull back. I, I remember in those days, there's, you know, blood on the floor all the time. Like even the girls, they used to kick them full power with front kicks and stuff like wow. that. People, you know, and, you know, to, to, to last. And it, it taught you a few things. You're able to, so, um, and you're in the same position as well. I mean, that you've done all these arts where you actually fought, been in the you ring. You have like to do before, full contact, yeah. Yeah, before you went into Wing Chun, right? Yeah, like, exactly. uh, and, and so being in there against an opponent holds no fear for you, right? And exactly. we were lucky. We, we were lucky in, in, in Hong Kong because they respected us. Um, one of the main reasons, and I've got to tell you this story because it's so funny, and you've got to show William this. He'll love this, right? And, and uh, yeah, because what happened when I went to Hong Kong, um, no one knew who I was, right? But what they knew that there was only two Wing Chun schools in Melbourne. There was the William Chong Academy and us. And 
they are so frightened of him over there, right? They were so frightened of William in, 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 in because he was the biggest, the strong, and he's the youngest of all of them. He could still, when he went back there, you know, he, he, he could still fight. Those guys were old, you know, like Choi Shunkin, that they started as adults and they're like, uh, obviously, they're a bit older than him, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, so they, they said, You're Barry Payne, he goes. You teach in Melbourne, don't you? Yeah. He goes, oh, so I'll take you out for dinner. Yeah. I'll take you out for lunch. And, and they, they said, why? I don't even know you. He goes, yeah, but um, yeah, for 20 years, you've taught in Australia, in Melbourne, alongside William Chong, and you're still alive. So you must be all right. You must be all right. We haven't seen you. You must be all right. Yeah. You must no be one else. Right. Those people won't even dare come to Melbourne, let alone, you know, um, um, and, and it was so funny, you know, Long Teng Sivu invited me to, you know, to dinner and they asked, the, the, you know, they, they kept asking, you know, so what's William really like? <laughs> yeah, and all this stuff, right? But it opened a lot of doors and they were willing, you know, to, to talk to us because they, they knew via reputation that, Never seen this guy. His Wing Chun might be the worst in the world, but for 20 years, uh, he's taught Kung Fu in Melbourne, Wing Chun, alongside William, and hasn't been closed down. So, <laughs> so he, he must be all right. He you know? must so, be all right. So, so you should that, be proud. That, you should yeah. be proud. I think, you know, I mean, I'm sure we're going to have to wrap this up soon, but you, you've got so much to offer. You've got so much wealth of knowledge. You should write a book. In Africa, well, we were, th we were trying to do that. We we're, do were doing it at, at one stage, uh, uh, but it's hard to find the right author. You know, like we had people interested and then, you know, dropped out because, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, what, what I like to do is, you no, know, really, it's not so much um, uh, what I've done is what the students have done. Yeah. Because now we're at the stage we are teaching martial arts now. We're not competing anymore. We're too old to compete. Well, I am. You, you may not be. You can still compete, <laughs> but I'm too old to compete now. But yeah. uh, what, who you've taught and how you've passed it on is so, so important. And, um, you know, uh, I know Emma's done the, the podcast with my wife, Anne, and, you know, I'm just so proud of, you know, what I've been able to pass on. And, and it's really drawn the boundaries to the next level that not just us doing it, but it's actually a woman doing it, going back to the position like Mui's day where she can beat all the blokes yeah, right. because of superior Kung Fu, not superior strength or anything else, but because of superior Kung Fu. And it just proves the point that, uh, you know, the art has been passed on live and well. And that's what we, that's what we want to do. And, uh, yeah, it's just unfortunate. It's got very commercial these days, you know, martial arts. And yes. I'm very fortunate that, you know, I've done all right, that I don't need to de de depend on that, that, you know, I've been so lucky that if I don't like a student, I can turn them away. Yeah, <laughs> other people in the business can't, you know, because, uh, you know, you've got to pay the rent. And uh, so basically... I, I, and I can keep the standard and I'm able to say, okay, well, we reckon you should do Silentail for a couple of years before you go on to the next day. If you don't like it, go to another school where you can learn the wooden dummy straight away. But, uh, but, but come back and, and have a try against some of these students that, um, you know, have spent the time, you know, or even, you know, have a try at uh, some of our female students. You know? <laughs> it's amazing. It's good. No, thank you so much, Barry, for being here with us today. And I think, you know, and like, like you said, you're right. You know, we want to keep the tradition going. And I think it's important for people to be patient. And, and it's important for people to know um, valuable information and valuable knowledge. It's like going to schools in uni. You know, you can't, you can't be a doctor or any, anything else in life by just brushing through a two-month course, you know? Yeah, well, yeah. What, we, what we want to be able to do is that now that you get this all around the world, uh, Damien, and people can see... And they can judge for themselves the standard of instructor in their own area. It's unfortunate a lot of places that really crave for Wing Chun 
no one's willing to go there and teach. I mean, like, you know, Africa and some of those countries, Middle East, and that, mm. they, love the, they love the Wing Chun, right? They want to mm. learn, but there's no one there that's actually qualified to teach it. But through our podcast and our videos, Obviously. and that, we can reach them. At least they can see it. And the other thing we want to do is to preserve it for future generations. When we're gone and you know, we look back, uh, people can get these videos and say, well, that was what Wing Chun was like in uh, 2020. Um, now, uh, you might have a gifted martial artist that can look at those things and get something out and bring back the art because I'm sure so many martial artists have lost, like we said, you know, how much of, what percentage of Wing Chun was lost when Yip Man passed away, you know? And what about all, all those fighting arts from the Vikings, the Romans and all that? They must have been pretty good. Their, you know, their lives depend on it. It's all gone now. If only we had social media and, like and all this technology when Moy was alive, then we <laughs> can actually have filmed her and we can look at it ourselves and, uh, and train from there. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, thank you so much for preserving the art, Barry. Like, you know, I mean, I'm sure people, you've, you've got so many videos yourself on YouTube, on the internet, on your website. And, and like you said, Annie's amazing. And it's all about the fact that you can look up themselves, you know, if a student uh, is studying the art of winching, they can look up themselves in terms of what's credible. Well, if you can just uh, let the people know what the link is to our website, it's got, like you said, there's hundreds of videos on there um, and, uh, you know, giving the explanation and how how it relates to the, the other styles like uh, uh, Lung Ying. And, uh, you yeah, know, if people are like what they see on this podcast, but they can go onto there and there's many hours of entertainment for them. Absolutely. You're doing great. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much again for being with us today. And hopefully we'll have you again back on another podcast. Hopefully okay. we'll be in person after this COVID is over, you know? Yeah, and we'd love to and you know, demonstrate do some with... different type of wintering as well. So yeah, of course. Yeah, we could do some technical ones if you like, you know, I mean, uh, you know, people always love those. So, um, you know, uh, we, we're loving what you're doing and, um, you know, getting the martial arts together. Um, and and, and it's, it's great. Uh, you know, look forward to the next next one. Thank you so much, Barry. Thank you. Okay. No worries. Thank Bye. you. Bye.